Welcome back, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so for our second panel, we are uh, extremely fortunate to have with us several uh, very accomplished journalists who cover a range of topics in a range of contexts. Um, and I'll start by introducing myself and then our, our panelists and kind of jump into the discussion for this morning. So uh, my name is Susan McGregor. I am the Assistant Director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism. Um, I actually have been doing a lot of research in the last year or so on uh, digital security for journalists and source protection. Um, I uh, authored a report on the topic. Uh, a few months ago, um, also got to collaborate with somebody on this fun poster in the corner um, <laughs> with a great illustrator on that. Um, but one of the reasons why we wanted to put together this event and something that um, that that I think uh, we've seen the coverage of, we've seen a lot of activity in the press, uh, you know, talk about Snowden, uh, talk about these these sort of major national security cases um, where, uh, you know, reporters and their sources are being targeted even within the U.S. borders. And, and I think that's a bit of a wake up call for all of us, but I think one of the challenges that I've seen is that a lot of the rhetoric has really focused on these very high profile kind of national security issues. And while of course national security reporters do need to be concerned about protecting their sources and thinking about their digital communications, um, you know, what we realize is actually that uh, these activities are pervasive enough that all journalists should be thinking about them. And so what we really wanted to do with this panel was to talk to a group of people who um, are working day to day in the field um, and, and can sort of share their experiences of how source protection factors into their work. And I think also because, you know, as the earlier panel demonstrated, there's a lot to think about. And, um, if you've been in the journalism business for more than five or ten years, you know that um, you know your job responsibilities have expanded and exploded uh, with uh, with uh, new media uh, and new responsibilities. And so I think for a lot of us, the question is, you know, how do we really do this, right? Like, how do we really do this on a day-to-day -day basis? What are the things we need to think about? You know, what does it mean to try to file a story on deadline um, if you are you know, also having to do some kind of unusual communication with your source. How do we convince sources to use these things? Um, and so that's what I, we, we really want to sort of talk about here today. Um, so I will just do very, very brief uh, introductions across the top and then we'll get going. Um, Agnes Tyle. I got that kind of right from, yeah. <laughs> from uh, the Septentrion Infos, is yeah. that correct? Um, who is a, uh, who's a Nigerian journalist um, who's been, I'm sorry? Cameroon. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But do you cover, yes, who's been working, is a Cameroonian journalist who's been working in uh, covering parts of uh, doing uh, really a lot of journalism under threat, covering major issues um, in Cameroon, um, and uh, has uh, dealt with a lot of these issues in um, the most extreme cases, unfortunately, um, dealing with uh, threats against uh, threats against her life, and uh, in a context that's very different from the ones that most of us operate in. But in some cases, we may also have sources working in those areas. Um, we have Andy Greenberg from Wired, um, who has written extensively on uh, sort of hacker community surveillance source source issues. Um, Sarah Lynch from Reuters, um, who covers financial crimes on the SEC, and Lorenzo Franceschi Bicarai. <laughs> I had to pra practice that one a lot, uh, from Mashable, um, who also covers uh, sort of internet security and, and hacker communities. Um, so I think the, uh, the first thing that I would love uh, to just ask each of you to share would be maybe one experience um, that you've had as you've been covering something, <laughs> um, and and or maybe maybe more specifically, when you're communicating, if you think of a particular uh, story that you were working on, communicating with a source, um, a strategy that you have used to try to protect their identity or their information um, as as you've as you've spoken with them, whether you were the person who initiated that process or not, and maybe let us know whether it was the source that asked you or, or whether that it was something that you suggested. So um, Agnes, may we start with you? Thank you. Hi. I'd, I would like to start uh, by just saying, mentioning that today is a really great day in Cameroon because we just have 27 hostages. Uh, they were um, uh, kidnapped um, in May, May and June, and they just got released. So it's a kind of good day <laughs> in Cameroon. Um, it can be a good news for, for population, but not probably good news for the government. We don't really know how they have been released most of the time. 
when we get a hostage release like that, there is a lot of money underneath. So we, all, we start digging already. Um, one situation that I uh, probably deal with, um, I mean, how, how I did it most of the time in, in Cameroon, uh, I, I have to mention that the internet uh, penetration is really low, so it's like 4%, I would say, of the population that can get access to internet, so it's really low. Uh, but we have numbers and numbers of uh, people who have uh, cell phones. And what I was doing before is just to keep changing numbers because um, in, I think it was before 2010, you didn't have to give your ID like to get, to get a new uh, cell phone number. So what I was doing is just getting a new phone, a new number every time that I, you know, I feel like I'm not safe enough with that number. So I kept on changing numbers over and over. That was one of my tricks. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way here, so. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, I'm here pretty much because of an experience I recently went through at the SEC. Um, I was doing kind of routine reporting, which what I consider routine reporting, um, they were voting on a big settlement with J.P. Morgan Chase. J.P. Morgan, you may have seen in the news, was in trouble um, because a trader in London had amassed this huge position. They caused a lot of losses. So every agency was uh, going around and voting on their portion of this $900 million settlement. So I was trying to find out just basically how they vote, who was recused, who voted no, and if so, why they voted no. And so we just reported that in a series of um, articles. and. Couple, very shortly thereafter, um, somebody complained about the leak, and uh, the chair of the SEC, Mary Jo White, um, asked the inspector general to launch an internal investigation to find who had leaked this, uh, that information to me. And they had gone through, um, they basically interviewed 53 people, as it turned out, and they looked at 39 different BlackBerry records, I believe. They looked at building logs to see when I'd been inside the building and to try to ferret out this, this information. They, they put together in a report, and they couldn't actually find my sources. They could see who I talked to because metadata, uh, you know, obviously there's a phone record, there's an email record. Um, you, you can't completely avoid that. Um, so that ended up, by the way, ironically getting leaked, unredacted to Congress, who then leaked it to the press. And then that <laughs> became like a huge um, series of stories that came out about this crazy investigation into this leak. So the one thing I think I learned from it, and I think I did this during that time of the reporting, but now I'm going to do it even more. Um, you know, in my case, you can't you can't necessarily get these people to agree to you know send encrypted email to me and, and vice versa. You can't even sometimes get them to give you your their cell phone. I mean, they're scared. They're bureaucrats who work in an agency that just want to keep their head down and do their job. So you, what you can try to do, and what I do is. I call as many people as possible. You know, you need to create a cloud of dust. You need to call 10 people. It doesn't even matter if they don't know the information. Once you get that nugget that you need to publish, and maybe you want to get two sources because that's generally better, I would say just call 10 people. Stall them, keep them on the phone so that if they go back and they look at the records to see how long you're on the phone with the person, oh, well, you know, the reporter was on the phone for 10 minutes. A lot could be said in 10 minutes. I mean, I would just say that is a strategy that I used that worked. Um, in this particular case, there were also some private uh, email, private cell phone that was discussed. But this person, you know, you can't always protect your sources. He forwarded it to his SEC account. And um, <laughs> that's something I cannot control. I mean, I, the reason I contacted him on the private email was for a very good reason. Um, and the other thing I would say is, if you're going to use government email, and a lot of the time you have to in these kinds of agencies when you're getting to know people, there's no other way to get in touch with them. Don't put anything specific. And in this case, there was an email between myself and somebody, and it said, hey, can you give me a call to discuss what we were discussing the other day? And that's all it says. Don't put any, anything that's sensitive in email. And I have a lot of sources. Um, even for this panel, I had like, asked a source of mine, you know, what's your pet peeve? What really bugs you about reporters when they're trying to come to you to ferret out information? And he says, they put things in email that are very specific. A day after a closed door meeting, they'll email me and say, what was said in that, you know,
closed door meeting. I mean, these guys have filters on the emails. They might be filtering for certain words. The government has filters in their email systems. Banks have filters in their systems. If the word investigation or so, I don't know what words they have plugged in for it, but the word investigation or something could get caught up in their filter and, you know, be a red flag. And inspectors general, um, you know, they can't come after reporters in most cases that I know of, at least in my case, because it's a civil agency. They can't subpoena me. Um, but they can sure subpoena, you know, the staff there. They can force them to be deposed. Um, and so, you know, don't put anything specific and just call as many people as you can. Andy? Yeah. Well, I would say that the, the ideal scenario for source protection is that you don't even know who your source is. If you can confirm the information through some other channel, then ideally you don't even want to know the identity of the person that it came from. Uh, I think that that was the lesson of WikiLeaks and to a, a lesser extent. I, I think the beginning of the Snowden affair began that way as well. I don't think Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald knew who their source was, but they were looking at these documents that were clearly real and in incredibly impactful. So, uh, you know, I, I try whenever possible to be in that kind of WikiLeaks situation where I'm speaking with this, uh, an anonymous source and and I'm lucky in the sense that I cover the hacker community and that they know how to do these. You know, they, they, I don't have to teach them uh, about encryption and anonymity tools. They actually teach me. And I, my career has been a process of learning from them. And in fact, when you're, when you're trying to have an anonymous conversation with someone, it kind of has to start with the source protecting themselves. Uh, if they reach out to you over clear texts, you know, over un, an unprotected channel in the first place, then you know you've already essentially alerted. There's already a record of 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 your conversation. So ideally, um, it has to start with them protecting themselves. I and then I try to just provide every possible channel um, for them to you know to, to contact me without establishing that initial connection. So um, the lesson we learned from WikiLeaks is that you can set up a Tor hidden service where people can drop information. They still have to run Tor to access it. You know, the, the source has to know how to use Tor. So, uh, again, it's they have to they do have to protect themselves in a sense. But you want to create these channels. Um, at, at Forbes, uh, where I worked before coming to Wired, we we created our own Tor hidden service for people to leak us documents. But it it doesn't have to be that complex. That um, everyone should talk to Runa Sandvik about setting up a secure drop um, Tor hidden service at their media organization. But it. On a simpler level, you just want to have like a, a PGP public key, for instance. That's the kind of most basic uh, way to allow people to contact you through private means. If you don't have that, then you kind of have cut yourself off from an, a giant swath of really important people. Um, and then you just you need to know how to use basic tools like uh, off the record instant messaging with, with Jabber, for instance. Uh, but just uh, essentially having these these tools allows you to just be open to sources contacting you. So I've been able to do, you know, stories about, you know, WikiLeaks members who would only speak over en encrypted channels, or uh, like a colleague of Snowden's c contacted me to set the record straight about some things about his career and the, what it was like to work with him. And uh, and I don't know who that person is, but I was able to confirm the facts through other NSA sources, uh, and that entire. Thing happened over you know over PGP just because I, I had a, a, a public key out there so it's kind of about um, I think just leaving yourself open to letting the source begin the conversation Lorenzo yeah um, I don't have any horror stories fortunately um, so um, it's you know I'm not gonna say like Sarah Sarah has definitely went through something that nobody should ever go through but like Andy said, I think that these kind of tools are important for journalists to know about because you just never know when you might uh, have to use them. So, you know, like the classic example that you've heard over and over is like when Snowden reached out to Glenn Greenwald, he didn't know how to talk to him because Snowden insisted on PGP and Glenn didn't even know what it was. And that's okay. I mean, you know, I, I didn't know what PGP was a year and a half ago. Maybe I knew about it, but I didn't use it. But um, you know, these days, it's like fact-checking. It's just writing and reporting. It's another um, skill that you should should know about and that you should have. Um, I think the best example is uh, 
once I, I was writing about Strongbox, the predecessor of SecureDrop, and Kevin Paulson, who worked uh, with Aaron Swartz on Strongbox, told me that uh, having SecureDrop uh, for your news organization is like having a disabled ramp at a restaurant. You're not, like your restaurant is not for disabled people, but once mm. a day, maybe a disabled person will want to come to your restaurant and you want to be ready. You don't want him to go, you know, you don't want to go to another restaurant because you don't have a disabled ramp. And I mean, that's exactly why I think this is important. Like I don't use PGP every day, but I know how to do it. And if the next Edward Snowden comes to me, um, I will know how to respond. And it's just about, you know, have, being ready and knowing what to do when you, when he comes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have, um, yeah. Good. I was actually going to say, because that, that, that brings up something that, I, that I'm that i sort of curious about and I think is a really, like, it's, it's kind of a big, it's a big obstacle, obstacle to get over. Um, you know, again, as journalists, like, we have so many different, we have so many different communication channels to manage, so many different deadlines to manage. Um, you know, we're talking to different people about different things. Um, for each of you in your experience, I mean, as you do this, does this, has this changed, um, do you just do the secure thing all the time? Or is this a case, or do you find that you are kind of switching? And if you do switch and kind of sometimes use, like you mentioned PGP, so sometimes you use this, but maybe sometimes you don't, or sometimes you use Twitter, but sometimes you use CryptoCat. Um, you know, do you use the same, do you do it all the same one way now that's just more secure, or do you switch back and forth? And if you do switch back and forth, how do you make that call? Like, when do you know it's time to, make that choice. So, uh, you know, if some, anybody wants to start, but yeah, I'd love to hear from all of you, if possible. Mm -hmm. I, I think I just, maybe, I don't know if this is really the right approach, but I, I, I let the source set the security level, essentially. Mm -hmm. So if someone contacts me over, uh, you know, with an encrypted email, then I'll always encrypt my email back to them. And even, I find that in many cases, I'm talking with people who have they're not telling me anything sensitive at all, and it's an, it's kind of like an, uh, it can be really time consuming to you know like go through the process of encrypting and decrypting everything in this conversation, and it can feel kind of pointless. But it's a gesture of respect that that they consider you know they, they have that sensitivity, and you want to um, honor that. Yeah. yeah, but I but I certainly don't insist that everybody um, encrypt their emails to me. You know, in fact, it's. It's still impossible to do that. You can't. Um, I mean, most people don't know how to use PGP still. Mm -hmm. But it, but there are certain tools that are coming that are just um, arising, like uh, an app called Signal for for iOS it can encrypt all of your voice calls to anyone else who has Signal or the Android equivalent called Red Phone, and it's really just as easy as making any phone call. It can kind of replace your whole calling app on the phone. Uh, and in that case, I actually do make encrypted calls to everyone I can who has it, just because there's no costs in terms of efficiency. And you, know, you might as well just kind of encrypt more of your communications, uh, create more of a kind of cloak of, of darkness around them so that the sensitive ones don't stick out. Yeah. In, in my case, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to let the source uh, uh, set up to, you know, uh, it's, it's difficult because they don't even know it's dangerous. So you can't let them start yeah. Yeah, to do it because most of the time what I have is people who want to say things, they have so much to say and they start saying it without, you know, uh, putting some barriers. Uh, and it's, it's really, really hard to even um, tell them that what they are doing it's, it, it's dangerous. Um, I find it more and more difficult since I've been here that I'm dealing with online news. Um, I find it more difficult for me to protect my sources than when I was in Cameroon. Because in, back home, they wouldn't uh, like to talk to me even face to face. And they might think talking on the phone, uh, it's safer for them. But it's not. It's probably more dangerous. So it's kind of difficult to let the sources just, you know, uh, set up the, the 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 rules. So in in that case, Agnes, what what do you have particular strategies that you use to 
if a source comes to you, because say, do you suggest certain technologies or certain ways of communicating to, to better protect them in those cases? It's kind of hard because even with my own team, it's hard. Uh, the, the, I have to say that the Le Septentrion is talking only about Cameroon mm -hmm. and some other news coming from here goes to Cameroon too. So my team, the whole team is in Cameroon. Uh, and I'm the only one who is here. I get all the news online, and so everything is based online. If I can, if they don't have connection to send me the, some articles, then sometimes they have to make a call, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, and I have to record it and then trans translate it and, and write it down. So I have, I'm, I'm editing it. Every, I'm editing everything here, and I have to just send them the PDF. Sometimes, you know, it's it's kind of hard for them to understand. Uh, that what they're doing is difficult, it, even teaching them that this is the way to do it properly without being in danger, uh, it's, it's, it's still hard. It is really, really hard. So that's why sometimes I, I, I have to put some um, information away to protect not, not only the sources, but also my team. Because yeah. I, I need them. I want them to be, to, you know, to be, I don't want them to be as crazy as I am. <laughs> so, yeah. Not sure crazy is the word I would use. <laughs> Especially not nowadays. We know none of it's crazy. Um, yeah, Sarah or Lorenzo, um, any? Uh, encryption hasn't really come up for me. I mean, this is the, sort of the, I mean, well, there have been a couple other investigations, not as hardcore, I'd say, as this investigation, but, you know, this is sort of a new thing for me. And frankly, I don't know. I don't know what the capabilities are with regard to the, you know, the government, you know, somebody being able to encrypt their sec.gov email or their treasury email anyway. They'd have to probably use a private email, and getting to that step is extremely difficult. It's hard to even get people to talk to you. I mean, that's part of the challenge of working in Washington, you know, and covering agencies where you're not allowed to walk around with free access to just go up to anybody you want. You have to try to find where they're speaking at places and establish a relationship mm -hmm. and exchange information and, and build up a source relationship over time. So I usually let the source as well sort of set, you know, set the tone of how we should proceed. I mean, some of them will only want me to meet them in person, you know, and uh, in one case I recently had somebody sneak me in through the back through the garage so I didn't have to sign in to show I was there in the building. I mean, that's up to that person. I let them decide. And if they say, you know, email me at sec.gov, they know, I believe, very well what, what risks that is to them because they've seen what's been happening. Um, there have been two in this particular agency, very aggressive inspectors general, in the time that I've been covering the agency since 2008. Um, they love, for some reason, these people love going through staff's email there. They love doing depositions. I mean, a lot of SEC staff at one time had insurance to be able to hire lawyers because they knew they might get deposed in some sort of investigation. And the current inspector general uh, has like a forensics type background and I think he might like doing this. <laughs> just so just likes doing it. it. So I, you know, there's so much, only so much you can do. Um, and so I, I really think in the government, they, most people know what, what it's like to deal with the press or, they, or they're familiar with, you know, what's happening and they set the, they set the um, agenda for how we, how we communicate. Did you want to? Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to add that there is um, another way to avoid it. That's why I'm going to say the old fashioned, which is just send, send the person a mail. Because they might check, they, they, literally, they, they literally check the mail, actually. Even in my, in my own country, they wouldn't uh, open you know, your mail. So send them by post office a mail. They don't check the mail. Most of the time, they don't. They, since true. we got the internet and everything, everybody goes online, yep. and they don't check the mail no, no more. And we also have the, another technique, which is, uh, I don't know how you guys call it. It's like a, a dead mail, dead email. Mm -hmm. uh, you will be creating an address, and there would never be, you know, you will never send the, the email, so it's just going to stay there. Everybody uh, who get access to that email um, is going to have the password and the address, and you, you can f find everything uh, in the, um, the um, save, uh, you're going to save it as a, as a file or, you know, put it anywhere you want, but you will never send it. No email will go through that uh, address, so that's two things that we do, actually. I say, it sounds it's a little like a, an email, almost like an email dead drop. 
Yeah, yeah. It's a, that might work in Cameroon. It, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting idea because there's no, uh, there are no like incoming or outgoing emails to check. But I think that that's what General Petraeus used yeah. with his. I was gonna say, that's, um, that was they thought with the draft. Yeah. That was they, so they thought the draft. You gotta be careful yeah. like, who's hosting now that email. Now they know that trick. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, and Google was able to give them up because you know, it was all hosted on Google servers and they responded to a subpoena, so. But I, I agree with the mail, oh sorry. No, I, I was gonna say, I agree with the mail. I've had anonymous people mail me documents. I don't even know who they were. I was able to verify them and able to report on them. Um, and there is a risk to that person, but you can't, it's, out, it's sort of outside your control. Most of the government has like an audit trail and they can look, it's like an internal cloud and they can look and they can see, you know, who had access to it, who printed it, who emailed it. But, you know, I mean, there's only so much you can do, especially if you don't know who's sending it to you. So, but I, I do find, I have the couple times that I've gotten mailed documents, um, I've never heard any um, feedback about them actually being able to catch the person. So whatever they did, it, it, that I maybe added an extra layer of protection and um, they didn't get caught. So if you can get snail mail or you tell <laughs> Use them to it. You know, send it to you that way, I, I would say that would be a great idea. Lorenzo, did you wanna? Yeah, I mean, mail is definitely like all the, the legal protections, for example, as I think Aaron mentioned it in the uh, previous panel. Uh, ma physical mail has better protection than email right now in the U.S. But, I mean, there's an example for, of uh, like Silk Road uh, uh, dealers that got caught because they sent packages uh, at the post office and they didn't know that the system took pictures of them while sending the packages. So, I mean, there's no, like the thing is, there's no, uh, you know, silver bullet. There's no golden key. There's no, like, secret. You have to be able to use a variety of tools, and the more you're familiar with, the better, because you just don't know. Um, and as like as Sarah and Andy have said, I mean, oftentimes it's the source that sets the tone. So if either their first email is encrypted, then it means that they want to protect something. And maybe you don't know what they're trying to protect, but you re re you reply with an encrypted email, so that you know you just you basically you're speaking the same language. And in terms of your initial question, I think that, I mean, you have to do a little bit of everything. I don't think you can encrypt everything because, first of all, it takes time and it's also, it might also be a red flag. Like if you're encrypting, I mean, the ideal scenario is like you're encrypting everything. So you're like, okay, I'm talking to my girlfriend by encrypted email. That's okay. But, you know. Um, might be glad of that later. <laughs> but, you know, like it's, you just have to. Using all kinds of channels is also good because, like, then if they look at your communications, then you see, okay, he uses a little bit of this, a little bit of that. With once this source, he has used PGP sometimes, PGP not a lot of other times. It's just like you're making it more harder for them to figure out what you're doing. And use text, for example, text secure uh, is the same thing as Signal, but for Android, it just basically replaces your uh, default message uh, software on your cell phone and. You don't even have to think about it. You, you install it, you set it as default, and you forget about it. It sends normal text, it sends encrypted text to people who have it. So tell your friends to have it, like I, uh, to use it. I told my cousins and my friends to install it. Like, you know, I install it to them, but now they use it because it's there, and they don't even think about it. That's the ideal scenario, obviously, you know, but, you know, if more of us use these tools, then more people will use them too. It's just like, it's a economy of scale. It, it will take some time, but you know, start using it, start getting acquainted with them, and eventually everybody will use them. Yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like one of the things, and I think it's one of the great things about having you know, this, this panel of people together is that a lot of it is about context, right? I mean, you know, Sarah, you have sources where they, they have to or they will only use their government email, and Agnes, you have sources that you know, don't under, you know, that don't know anything about encryption or protecting their information and your sources at Andy and Lorenzo are, you know, coming to you with encrypted emails. And so um, I think it was mentioned in the first panel, this idea of like, you know, locking, you know, you lock your front door usually when you leave the house, right? And that, you know, I think most of us, uh, the way I think of it is most of us appreciate that, you know, locking your front door is not gonna stop a SWAT team. Right? There are different, you know, you have to, you have to be thinking about who, who's trying to get access to the information and also what the capabilities um, of your 
of your sources are, um, some of whom are gonna use this technology and some of whom uh, are not. But I think what's exciting about what you're saying too is that there's a lot of ways to do this, right? There's a lot of ways that you can make this work and maybe it's making 20 phone calls a day to 20 different people and just talking to them about the weather because that makes it harder to tell what's going on, um, you know, or, uh, you know, or encrypting things to lots of different people. Um, but it's also getting a lot easier. It's getting easier really quickly right, right now in, the, in this post Snowden era. Everybody wants to sell you an easy, you know, super easy encryption tool or give it away open source. I think, I mean, it, in the past this has been just something that hackers and intelligence people do, but it's very quickly becoming something that like your sources could do or yours too. You know? So um, like the, the signal app that I mentioned is completely, uh, it's like, you know, a piece of cake. It's, it's, it, there's no longer a, a cost to encryption, right. or it's getting smaller every day. Sen more sensible, yeah. sensible default, as we like to say. Um, so one thing I also wanted to address, and I do want to have some time for questions uh, from the from the assembled uh, folks here, but uh, is maybe if some of you could talk to us without getting yourselves in trouble, uh, or a little if you want. Um, how, how does this work inside of an organization? Agnes, I think you're, you're in charge of your, your organization, although obviously working in a much more uh, sort of restricted context in other ways. Um, but I mean, it, again, in terms of, you know, you've, a few of you have said, well, you know, it takes longer to do this. I mean, I guess what I'm, you know, I think one of the things that's really challenging for working journalists is, you know, what's the opportunity cost going to be, you know? I mean, does this mean I need an extra, do I need to book in an extra 30 minutes a day for, you know, if I encrypt that email, does it take 10 seconds longer? Does it take 30 seconds longer? And also, you know, how do you, how, how have you found the interaction with your organization in terms of technical support or ability to install software, maybe talking to editors about deadlines or, you know, I mean, I think, I think the mail suggestion, the physical mail suggestion is a great one, right? But obviously, you know, if somebody's sending me something in the mail, that's maybe a few days to a week, not you know a 90-second file upload. Um, so, are there things that you guys have encountered where you've had to sort of negotiate either with um, you know editors or maybe colleagues or or uh, technical folks in your organization um, that have that have come up for you that. It makes it. If I mean, I would never recommend doing a single source story. It's anonymous, but a lot of the time that becomes a something you have to do, especially in Washington where everybody's anonymous sources. But it makes it that much more difficult because now you really need to get at least two. So you can say people familiar with the matter, say. And if you, you know, otherwise, if you have a person familiar and it's just a single person um, and you publish that and they decide to go look for that person, they know there's only one person they're looking for and if mm. that makes it really hard. So you have to work extra hard to try to get that extra source, not just because it's good for good ethics and it's good journalism to have multiple people confirming something that you're publishing, but also because that person could become the target of an investigation and you're making it that much easier. And a lot of people say to me, now, please don't just run this story with what I'm telling you. Please get it as well from somebody else. And if you, if you can't get somebody else to say that, you may think twice about publishing it and then, you know, you may have a competitive disadvantage if somebody else is onto the same, same story. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges is telling your organization um, because not everybody gets this stuff and this is, this, a lot of this stuff is very new. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to tell them that this is worth it and you have to tell them that it's necessary. You know, you can always use the Greenwald example. You can tell them you won a Pulitzer because of this, basically. <laughs> you know, he would have not have won a Pulitzer without... If learning. I use PGP, I'll win a Pulitzer. No. Yeah, you know, like it's, that's not like the entire truth, but, you know, they get that. So, and, and the advantage, I mean, Andy probably knows a lot about this too. Like, you know, you have to, um, you know, the, the more organizations have it, then you can also be like, hey, they have it. Why don't we have it? You know, like secure drop. Forbes has it, um, a new, the New Yorker has it, uh, a local paper in San Francisco has it, why don't we have it, you know, like, and at a certain point it will become like, you, you don't want to be the last one standing, you know, you don't want to be the one that doesn't have this kind of tool. And hopefully, but you know, it takes some advocacy, it takes some even activism, but 
it just, you know, tell your, uh, if you don't want to talk to your editor-in-chief, then talk to your fellow reporters who might, you know, who's your friend or, and slowly but surely, you know, more people will care and more people will get it. And then it will become inevitable at a certain point. Yeah. I've, I work for Wired where people are supposed to be technically savvy and it's still incredibly difficult to get my editors to encrypt anything. Uh, like. Uh, just PGP is like a giant encumbrance to them. So I, 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 I'm encouraged though, like I've said, by the fact that the cost of all of, all of this in terms of time and expertise is dropping like dramatically every day. There are another, like another set of tools that I think are really interesting are the ones um, built by Nadine Kobesi, like CryptoCats, and he now has released this thing called Minilock. It's always um, people in the crypto community like to pick on on Nadine because these things are so easy that they can't possibly work, right? Like, uh, I, I'm, you know, I spent so much time learning PGP, I'm not gonna start using this silly thing called CryptoCat that might actually now be, uh, in, be at least uh, secure enough to have a lot of kinds of conversations and it has essentially zero cost in, in terms of setup and expertise. So I'm, I am an advocate of these tools that are not like the, kind of, you know, decades old, uh, whatever, like command line geek stuff, but the things that, that everyone can use, because in fact, that's what you'll need to talk to your editors. You're, it's gonna be difficult in many cases to get them to use the, you know, the, the highest level stuff that actually is kind of technically difficult to, to set up. But I do think, like Lorenzo said, that, that everybody is, is learning these lessons, and the intercept is, this, you know, the, the, the new Glenn Greenwald or Poitras, Jeremy Scahill operation, I think is gonna teach them this lesson, uh, you know, in a really painful way once we see how many scoops they're getting really, I think by, by um, having the best operational security in the whole industry. You know, they have a secure drop implementation that's getting interesting stuff all the time from what I can tell. Uh, they have Michael Lee who is like the, um, this, you know, they, they have like someone, a full-time staffer essentially devoted to operational security and technology. So once, I, I think that like WikiLeaks, that'll be a lesson that editors will pay attention to in terms of you know, getting, on, uh, getting on board with encryption. Yeah. Agnes, in, in, you, you were able to call the shots a little bit in your context, but have you had experiences where you feel you've lost a story or you've had to, I mean, you mentioned sometimes having to hold information back from reporters. Um, you know, where you've had, kind of had to make that hard decision about, you know, either I get to publish this really important thing or... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, actually, I would say I worry about, um, I do worry about the sources in, the, in, the, in my team more than I, I worry about myself now. Uh, I think they are uh, in a dangerous situation because, like I said, they always want to talk, and they, they really talk openly on social media, we will have, uh, someone inbox you on Facebook, like, you know, I have this information, can we talk a little bit? I mean, I'm so surprised. We can easily do it now than while I was back home uh, with them, if you want to talk to somebody about something, just uh, interview with someone uh, on, um, uh, about a, a topic, like a common topic. They wouldn't talk to you just because you're a journalist. So I find it more and more difficult now to protect my own, my own team and um, how am I uh, how can we get to it? It, it we have to I would suggest training because mm -hmm. we have less and le we have we don't have a lot of training just specifically for journalists talking about uh, internet uh, security safety and everything they, they are not really aware of what is going on I can see uh, I have, I, when I'm on t Twitter, uh, Facebook, all those social um, uh, media, I read a lot of posts of journalists and I'm like, how? And does he really know what he's doing? Like now I know more about it and I hold it back. <laughs> like I, I, I'm really scared of what is going on when I see what is out there talking about online uh, safety. But 
I have to tell you, they really don't know what is going on. So it's, 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 it's really difficult. So maybe in a way, part of it is also for us within the journalism community to educate ourselves, you know, to educate our, our peers in the public about, you know, about these issues so mm -hmm. that people are, Absolutely. have a bit more awareness, um, not just in the context of, you know, I'm leaking a bunch of NSA documents, but also in these sort of more quotidian circumstances. Um, I mean, I think one thing that for me was very surprising, one thing we've seen is that, you know, maybe some of us appreciated these tools that were available to federal law enforcement and that these, uh, the subpoenas and uh, technologies like the so-called Stingray, which is used to essentially triangulate the location of a cell phone by pretending to be a cell phone tower, um, that although those were first identified as being used by federal law enforcement, um, are very often loaned out to local law enforcement. Um, so, you know, it's not just a question of am I being watched by the federal government, but now many of these things may be in the hands, or are often in the hands of, you know, you know, your local PD um, who, you know, we might have, uh, we might feel less comfortable about the kinds of things uh, they're willing to do with them uh, or the reasons for using them. Um, so I just wanted to open it up in case there are any, any uh, pressing questions from the crowd about uh, specific practices or, or issues that um, maybe our folks can, mo folks here can speak to. Otherwise, I'm happy to ask more questions. Yes, Jen. Uh, if, yeah, if possible, thanks. Um, so you guys talked a little bit about encryption and how it takes a while. So I'm curious about what is taking time because I know that once you, like as you set it up, it takes a little bit of time. But then as soon as you verify the key, so maybe that's what you're referring to, you just click the lock and you're, you're good to go is my understanding of PGP, that's how I use it. So I guess my question is what is taking time and then also how are you verifying your keys with your sources in a secure way that doesn't leave a bigger trail? Can I just interject briefly with yes. some vocabulary? So, Sorry. Uh, the, no, 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 it's a good question. So the question of it, when you encrypt emails, right, that basically there's kind of two parts to the process. One is actually getting that, that sort of digital identity, that long, long string of letters and numbers um, that is used to scramble your information before you exchange it with another person. And then the second part of the question is the process of how do you make sure that that big, long digital string you got actually belongs to human X or human Y, um, which are kind of two parts of the process. And, and which of those uh, is adding time? Is it actually getting the digital part or is it the, the checking with the person to make sure the digital thing you have really belongs to them? I definitely think that the, the setup is the time consuming part. It's not like a half an hour process every day to, you know, to like wait for things to decrypt or something. But uh, the other thing that I still haven't figured out, maybe somebody uh, knows how to do this, is to actually de decrypt um, a PGP email on a phone. Like uh, this is a, I, I'm constantly, uh, yeah, so, so anyways, right. So, um, so that's, I'm, just constantly not in the office or in front of my computer that has a private key on it. So that's just like a, an annoyance. So like I'm constantly like seeing these encrypted emails on my phone, you know, that may, might be urgent and I gotta wait until I'm in front of a computer to decrypt them. The key verification thing, I don't know. I, I, I guess, like I've said, in, in, the, in the cases where this is most important to me, uh, I, there's no other identity for me to verify that the key belongs to. I'm talking with an anonymous person in many cases. So verification of the key isn't an issue. You know, in, in other cases, I guess, um, I mean, I, I often uh, do have like other channels where I'm speaking with the, the source and, I, and we, I can corroborate that I'm talking to them. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have to admit that I'm not like, a, uh, like an expert on the sort of web of trust PGP model or anything like that, uh, but I, you know, usually like I'm talking to the same source with multiple channels. If it's someone who, who, whose identity I know in the first place, it's not one of these anonymous sources. Then you know it's pretty easy to to like talk about the material that they sent me um, earlier or like over another channel. Sometimes over an encrypted voice call. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I may, maybe I'm a sucker who's like talking with lots of fake sources, but I have I don't think I've ever had that experience. I was going to say, actually, one thing I've heard from folks, if it is a source you know, is um, voice is a great authenticator because if you know the sound of somebody's voice, then uh, you can be pretty sure that you're talking to them. Um, was there another question? Oh, uh, Sandy, and then we'll. 
sorry. Move, move the mic, move the mic. Oh, there we go. So a lot of these conversations um, by default seem to focus on the English speaking community. So this is a question for Agnes and Lorenzo. Can you talk a little bit more about the non-native English communities and some of the challenges that they may be facing in this? <laughs> well, um, well, I, I don't do them. I, I mean, I do mostly my work in English, obviously, being here. Uh, but I mean, I think this is, you know, there's technical people in other communities as well, you know, in the Spanish community, um, the Italian community. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, the internet is sort of like a universal language. So <laughs> if, they, if they're on the internet, they know. Um, how to use some of this stuff. So, I mean, th there's the same usual problem. They, they have to know the tool or you can teach them. Uh, but I don't think, I mean, I'm, language has never been uh, a big issue for me. Um, I mean, English is pretty universal, so that's the advantage of writing in English, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think it's, um I don't know if the, I don't think the language is a problem. Um, in my country, we bilingual, so we speak um, French, both French and, and English as um, uh, uh, official languages. Uh, but I would just, I just want to say um, that it takes, uh, as a challenge, I think it takes a lot of knowledge and equipment to, for the, especially for the reporters. Uh, we are probably in two different worlds here. Uh, um, n n not every uh, journalist in Cameroon um, has a computer at home. Not every journalist uh, in Cameroon has his own um, internet at home. So it's 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 a big challenge right there. You're not going to ask someone who goes to the uh, cyber uh, cafe um, to do certain things that he he can do on his own computer at home. So it's really, really hard to even teach them how to use um, certain tools. It's, it's, it's coming probably, but it's gonna take a certain time. It's a big challenge right there. So they don't have their own uh, computers and it, it, it's hard. Yeah, I guess I wanted to add, like one of the issues with language actually is that a lot of these tools, uh, don't like are not they don't have any documentation for like not non English speaking uh, people, so in terms of journalists like you know I I can teach them um, in their language I mean I don't know all the languages but <laughs> you know like if you're developing one of these tools then you have to think about um, giving it to as many people as you can so at, at the very least you know Spanish Arabic especially now these sensitive uh, I mean languages that c can be used in sensitive uh, areas. Uh, get a translator. I mean, you know, you might even get them for free. Uh, volunteers, you know, think about making them, making these tools available for everyone. But I think that you know, organizations like Open ITP, they're not like English uh, or American based exclusively, so they do that already. But that's definitely important. Like they should, you know, we should think about every kind of person. So, yeah. I think if we have one last question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so the impression I'm getting talking to a lot of people working in newsrooms like yourselves is that journalists are teaching themselves because they realize they need to. And it's either they are able to use static resources because they're, they're inclined that way, or they meet people who are hackers or privacy people to help them out. But there's everybody else in the newsroom, right? Is, there doesn't seem to be anybody to help flag them for potential issues akin to like a libel situation. There also doesn't seem to be anyone for them to go to, aside from their fellow journalists who they know could do this. Um, what's been your experience since Snowden? Has anybody started to say, oh yeah, maybe we should have this? Or is everyone like, I don't want to play spy versus spy, let's just let the law catch up? Like I said, the, I think The Intercept um, has a, a full-time OPSEC guy who's really good at his job, uh, and the larger Organization First Look just hired um, a guy, Morgan Marquibois from Google, who is a really um, renowned hack hacker and security expert. So that's kind of, I think, setting the bar for the, this new age of covering um, national security and other sensitive topics. But I, I don't know. It, I, I don't know how long it's going to take. I think that that may someday be like a, a typical newsroom staff position, like the security guy, but certainly not 
now. Or woman. I, um, I don't think, in our Washington Bureau anyway, I've gotten a sense that we've gotten really ramped up with our security. And actually, after having sat to watch the first panel, I'm now really concerned. And I think I'm <laughs> going to go back and kind of share some of the things that I heard those folks talk about. Um, I mean, the only thing I think I would say just generally not having to do with any encryption or anything is just um, you should be mindful, you know, when protecting sources, not just communicating with them, but in the, your own newsrooms, uh, especially if you work for a big organization like Reuters where there's a lot of emails that fly back and forth um, through, you know, with reporters and editors all over the world. Um, you know, if you're getting your sources approved, an anonymous source from your editor, don't put it in writing. It could get forwarded. It has happened before. I've seen it happen before, uh, or sensitive information has gotten forwarded at, because the person doesn't realize or something. Um, so I would just say be careful how you communicate with one another, and if you're sharing or you have access to confidential documents, be careful you know, how you're sharing those internally, not just externally with your source and yourself, but with your editors. But I do think we need to be thinking a lot more about some of these things. I mean, I, I think maybe in some of the overseas bureaus, they may be doing a little bit more there, but I don't think that there's enough focus yet in Washington and New York as there probably could be uh, and going forward, and hopefully we'll take this under advisement. <laughs> if I could ask, uh, just ask one more question, because you, you raise this point. This is an idea I've heard from a few people in a, different, in a few different contexts, is this idea of, again, I'm, I'm now latched onto this 10 calls a day idea, you know, calling lots of people. Um, is that somebody, somebody told, like, I mean, did somebody recommend that to you, kind of getting to this question of, of, you know, peer education, or, you know, did somebody say, hey, it's a good idea? I mean, I think classically that was a way to just keep your sources warm, was yeah. you just called 10 people a day so that they remembered who you were. Um, but I was wondering yeah. if that was something that was, was specifically mentioned, or if that's just what you've evolved. You know, at the time that I was doing that story, I was just doing what I always do which was just calling people to try to find the information and calling everyone I thought who may have the information. Um, and then after the fact, in hindsight, and I spoke with a lot of different colleagues in my bureau, and they all seemed to say that this should be a strategy I should use on a regular basis, mm -hmm. that it help, ended up helping protect me and protect my sources. That report that came out could have been a lot worse. If I had done one little misstep, anything you know out of place, it could have really hurt us. And we're lucky it didn't, because um, I was doing what I should be doing. But it made me realize that going forward, I have to be doing that even more than mm -hmm. I was before, even if I, you know, and maybe if, even if I don't, if I know the person won't know the information, just to put, put that call so it, it casts that kind of a wide, wide net. So it's something mm -hmm. I sort of learned after the fact, I think. Yeah. Lauren, so did you? Yeah, I mean, going back to the question, the original question, who do you talk to? Um, I mean, yeah, sometimes you are the only one that knows about this stuff, but in the newsroom. But, you know, like, uh, you know, going forward, every news organization is going to go online. I mean, they're already online, obviously, but it's going to be online only. So they're going to need tech, tech people. They're going to need geeks. And so talk to the IT guy. You know, the guy that sets, sets up your Wi-Fi maybe most likely knows about this stuff. It's just that nobody asks him. Uh, you know, it's not his job. It's not his primary job, but he knows about this stuff because he goes to hackers, he's been going to hackers conference forever. He just doesn't talk about it because that's not his daily job. But ask, ask him about it, like, how do I set up PGP? How do I, you know, how do I protect my computer? He knows about this stuff. Talk to the chief technology officer, you know, if they have, they have this knowledge. It's just that nobody asks them because you don't think about it. It's not in the newsroom. It's not part of your daily reporting experience, but they know about this stuff. And they're probably happy to tell you. Uh, about how to do these kind of things. Yeah, nice opportunity to cross barriers within the news organization. Um, all right, well, I just wanted, if you'll join me in thanking our wonderful, wonderful panel.